So in this video looking at special sequences, we'll be going over all the types of numbers that you need to know off by heart. Now there will be a note sheet in the description below which has all these numbers and what's expected for you to know off by heart. Now in maths, as well as remembering and learning all its methods and techniques, it's also important that you recognise and learn certain numbers and certain keywords. Now the first thing we're going to start off with is multiples and factors and it's really important that you understand their meaning but also impor important that you know and recognize the difference between the two. Now usually in exams when students make mistakes in dealing with multiples and factors the majority of them get the two things confused so they write down the factors instead of the multiples and multiples instead of the factors so it's really important that you understand what those two words mean and be able to draw any form of conclusions from them. The next thing we move on to is understanding your prime numbers and I would say that all students up to probably year 9 should know up to your prime numbers from the numbers 1 to 50. Now when you move into GCSE level, particularly if you're doing higher, then I would say it's important that you know your prime numbers up to 1 to 100. And then, then we move on to square numbers and roots. Now it's important that you're able to recognise a square number not simply by calculating or doing it in your head by just simply repeating off and recognizing what a square number is and I would say a bare minimum is knowing your square numbers up to 12 but ideally up to GCSE level you should be working up to your 16th square number and similarly with regards to cube numbers I would say it's important that you know your first five cube numbers as well as your 10th and then respectively know your cube root numbers as well now the next thing that is slowly making a return is triangle numbers. Now although you don't need to necessarily recall triangle numbers off by heart, what you need to be able to do is be able to write down a list of those triangle numbers and understand how those numbers are generated. And that leads us nicely onto Fibonacci sequence. Now it's important that not only do you know what the original Fibonacci sequence is, it's also important that you know how to generate it, not just with any sets of starting numbers, but also in algebra terms, which is what we will discuss in this video. So looking at multiples first, now a multiple is a number that appears in a numbers times or multiplication table. So a typical question might ask you is to find, so write down the first five multiples of, and then we'll give you a number. So if we start with seven, then basically what this question is asking me to do is to write down the first five numbers in the seven times table. So that's going to be seven times one, seven times two, seven times three, seven times four, and seven times five. Now obviously if it goes a little bit more complicated, so let's go for 13. So let me just uh, repeat the question. So the first five terms of 13, which in other words is the first five numbers of the 13 times table. So that's going to be 13, 26, 39, 52 and 65. Now if you were to get a question that was a little bit more complicated, so let's say 34, so obviously the first number is going to be 34 times 1, you can double that to get the second one. Now to help you decide what to actually do this is to split 34 into two numbers. So if you count 30 and then add 4, you'll make it a lot quicker than you actually just doing 34 times 3, 34 times 4, 35 times 5 etc. So for this all we need to do is starting with 60 or our last number that we've actually worked out correctly is all we need to do is add 30. So I've got 78, 88, 98 and then add 4 to that and I get 102. Then if I add 30 to 102 I've got 112, 122, 132, add 4 gives me 136 and then add another 30 to 136 that's 46, 146, 156, 166 add 4 gives me 170. So it's just an easier way of working through your times tables rather than using long multiplication to work out what the first five multiples are going to be. So moving on to factors. Now the definition of a factor is a number that is divisible leaving no remainders. Now when I ask my students what a factor is their typical answer would be is a number that goes into another number. Technically that is not true because you can actually divide any number by any number as long as it's not zero. However, what defines a factor is where it leaves no remainder. And that is the most important aspect. So a typical question might ask you is to write down all factors of 12. So basically what this question is asking me is what number can you divide by from 12 that leaves no remainders? So you can go through the list. Now because 12 is quite a small number, you can actually go through the numbers of 1 to 12 and just ask yourself, if I divide that number from 12, does it leave me with a remainder? So here I've got 12 divided by 1, which is fine. Can I divide 2 by 12? Yes. 
Does 3 go into 12? Yes. Does 4 go into 12? Yes. Does 5 go into 12? No. 6 go into 12? Yes. 7? No. 8? No. 9? No. 10? No. 11? No. And 12? Yes. So here are my factors. Now one thing you should spot that if you have done it in numerical order is 1 times 12 gives you 12, 2 times 6 gives you 12, and 3 times 4 gives you 12. So if you're given quite a complex number, let's say you're asked to write down the factors of, let's say, 40. Then one technique you might want to do is starting with 1, so I've got 1 times 40. Then I move on to my next number, which is 2. Just 2 going to it? Yes, because it's even, so it'd be 2 times 20. 3 doesn't go into it, 4 does, so that'd be 4 times 10. Does 5 go into it? Yes, because it ends in a 0, so that'd be 5 times 8. 6, no, 7, no, 8. Now you can see here that I've got, once I get to a point where I've gone from this number to this number, that's when I can actually stop. So although I've only going from 1 to 5, but then going from 5 to 8, because 8 is the next number from 5, because 5 times 8 gives me 40, I don't need to go any further. So here, what I've got now are all my factors of 40. So all I then need to do is just write this in a list. So I've got 1, 2, 4, 5, 8, 10, 20, 20, and there is all my factors of 40. Now when it comes to learning prime numbers, as I mentioned, that it's always important that you're able to know, ideally, off by heart, what a prime number is. Now the definition of a prime number is something that can needs to be clarified a little bit more distinctly. Now a prime number is a number that only has two different factors. And it's important that you use those important words of only two and different factors. So commonly, this is going to be one and itself. Now, it's important that you don't describe a prime number as a number that can only be divided by one and itself, because by that definition, as it's mentioned there in the key facts, that one by that definition would be a prime number because it's divisible by one and itself, which is also one. So that's why it's really important that whenever you're describing a prime number, that you always classify it as being a number that only has two different factors. So on the screen, you can see the list of uh, all the prime numbers from 1 to 100. Now in terms of the key facts that you need to be aware of is that 1 is not a prime number. As tempting as it may be, it's definitely not prime. 2 is the only prime, even prime number. And excluding 2 and 5, all other prime numbers end in either a 1, 2, 7 or 9. Now not all numbers that end in a 9 or 2, 7 or 1 are prime as you can see on the screen but it is important that you're able to learn these numbers off by heart just like you would like a spelling test. Now we're looking at square numbers and square roots now when you have a power attached to a number all that is basically telling you to do is multiply the base number which is the big number by itself by the number that is represented in the power so here what we have is 1 squared which means we're going to multiply 1 by itself two times so it's going to be 1 times 1 which gives me the answer of 1. Now, like with most things in maths, there's always a forward direction and there's a backwards direction. So the opposite of adding is subtracting, the opposite of multiplying is dividing, and vice versa. Now, there is an opposite to squaring a number, and that is what we call a square root. So in this particular example, our square number is 1. So let me just put that in a different color. Let's go for yellow. So this there is my square number. which is the answer of what I'm looking for. However, if I was to then do the square root of 1, then that would give me the answer of 1. So basically what that's doing is going from my square number back to my original base number, which is obviously just a big number. So here when we've got 2 squared, well 2 squared is 2 times 2, which is 4. So that means then the square root of 4 is going back to what base number do you square to get 4? Well, that's going to be... 2. 3 squared is 3 times 3, which is 9. So therefore, the square root of 9 is going to be 3. 4 times 4 is 16. The square root of 16 is 4. Now, like with most numbers, you can do this for any numbers, but we're just look, dealing with whole numbers first. So you could square an, a decimal number, you could also square a negative number, and you'll possibly most likely get a decimal answer. However, we're just focusing on the first sort of sets of square numbers. So 5 squared would be 5 times 5, which is 25. So therefore, the square root of 25 is 5. 6 squared is 6 times 6, which is 36. So therefore, the square root of 36 is 6. 
7 times 7 is 49, so therefore the square root of 49 is 7. 8, 8 times 8 is 64, so the square root of 64 is 8. 9 times 9 is 81, so the square root of 81 is 9. 10 squared is 100, so the square root of 100 is 10. 11 squared is 121, so the square root of 121 is going to be 11. And 12 squared is 144, the square root of 144 is therefore 12. Now, that's probably as much as you need to go up to, I would say, up to probably the key stage three. However, to extend your knowledge, it's really good practice, particularly if you're going into higher GCSE, to know your square numbers up to 16. So here we've got 13 times 13, which is that, that down, 13 times 169. The square root of 169 is 13. 14 times 14 is 196. So the square root of 196 is 14. 15 squared is 225, so the square root of 225 is going to be 15. And finally, 16 squared is 256, so the square root of 256 is 16. So the numbers that I'm highlighting in a pink circle are all our square numbers. And as I mentioned, that it's really good practice for you to know your square numbers, I would say ideally up to 16, but 12 is probably the bare minimum. And then obviously from your square numbers, you should, when asked to work out the square root of that, be able to return back to the original number. So for example, a question could easily get asked, what's the square root of 121? So you want to think, right, what square number gives me 121? Well, that answer would be 11 and so forth. Now that leads us nicely into cube numbers. So again here, the only difference here is our power is now a three rather than a two, but the general method is exactly the same. So here I've got one cubed is one times one times one which is just one. So therefore the cube root, which is like a little three with a root next to it of one, would equal one. Two cubed is two times two times two, which is eight, not six as most units tend to write. And so the cube root of eight is gonna be two. Three cubed is three times three times three, which is three times three is nine times three is 27. So this cube root of 27 is gonna be now four times four cubed is four times four times four, which is 64. And the cube root of 64 is four. Now 64 is quite special. And the reason why is because 64 not only is a cube number, if we go back, it's also a square number as well. So again, 64 is a little bit special in that context. And then five cubed is five times five times five, which is, 5 times 5 is 25, times 5 is 125, so the cube root of 125 is 5. And finally, 10 cubed. Now I know we're missing out 6 cubed, 7 cubed, 8 cubed, 9 cubed, but again, if you're wanting to work those out, then all you'd need to do, so for example, if I wanted to work out what 6 cubed was, that's going to be 6 times 6 times 6. Well, 6 times 6 is 36, so 36 times 6, and all I'd then do is just do a little bit of multiplication, out so I've got 6 times 6 which is 36 3 times 6 which is 18 plus 3 which is 216 is my answer so 6 cubed would equal 216 but in terms of recalling them I would say the first 5 and then 10 would be absolutely fine so finishing off what 10 cubed is that's 10 times 10 which is 100 times 10 which is a thousand so therefore the cube root of 1000 is equal to 10 now the next thing we move on to is triangle numbers. Now triangle numbers kind of disappeared, but is now making a bit of a comeback as to what they actually are. Now just like square numbers are basically making squares, so for example, got one and then a two by two, then I've got three by three, then I've got four by four. So so this represents my square numbers of one, four, nine. 16. Now triangle numbers are basically made by rather than dealing with squares but dealing with triangles. And what type of triangle? Well they're going to be right angle triangles. Now in terms of right angle triangle it's also looking at if any of you ever play snooker or pool it's basically how many balls you need to make a perfect triangle to play that game. It's the excluding nine ball for those pool fans. So in terms of where triangle numbers come from so here we've got one 
Then our second one is going to be again making a right angle triangle. Then I've got my next one. And what you should be able to notice is what I'm doing is I'm adding an extra layer to the left hand side of the previous triangle. So here I've got four on the left. So now my next one is going to have. So next one's going to have six. And this is where I'm going to stop. Sleep. Angles. Get to. I'm there. Now, in terms of the triangle numbers, all you're doing is just counting how many circles I've drawn. So here I've got 1, 3, 6, 10, 15. Here I've got. Now, in terms of the triangle numbers, as well as drawing it out, which can be a very mundane task, another way of looking at it is looking at the difference. So here you can see that the difference between 1 and 3 is 2. The difference between 3 and 6 is 3. The difference between 6 and 10 is 4. The difference between 10 and 15 is 5. The difference between 15 and 21 is 6. So without having to draw the next one, the difference is going to be 7. So without drawing the triangle, it's going to be 8. So if I was to write my triangle numbers out, I can just start by writing 1, 3, and then 6, then 10. So if I just remember the first four, that should set me off in terms of working out the difference and all I've then got to do is write the numbers above which is the difference so I've got 5 so the next number is going to be 15 this number is going to be 6 so that's going to be 21 then the next difference is going to be 7 I can just and then we've got 28 the next one is going to have a difference of 8 which is going to be 36 and so on so a question might ask you typically is find out what numbers are triangle numbers what not in which you can just start off and write down the numbers or a question might ask you is to write down the first let's say 10 triangle numbers and you go from there so that can either be done by diagram which i probably wouldn't recommend because it will take you a long time i would start off by writing a list starting with one and three and then recognizing that the difference is always going to increase by one now, Leonardo Bonacci, also known as Fibonacci more commonly, is a really famous mathematician. And he is the one that introduced the Hindu Arabic numeral system to the Western world, primarily used through his composition of the 1202 of Liber Abaci, which is basically the book of calculations. Now, Fibonacci is known to be the first mathematician who's introduced the system of zero and nine as numbers and to incorporate place value that we still use today. Now, Fibonacci is a amazing person the more you read into into him the more fascinating and facts that you will read into his sort of research and studies and it's something that i would definitely encourage people of or math people interested in maths to do a lot more reading through obviously wikipedia being your useful fountain of knowledge now fibonacci's one of his fibonacci's famous works is his sequence now what fibonacci discovered was if we start with the numbers of 0 1 as our first two numbers of a sequence and you add together the previous two numbers in a sequence to find the next number in the sequence so here we're starting off with 0 and 1 and 0 plus 1 is 1 then 1 plus 1 is 2 so what i'm doing is just adding those two numbers to equal 2 then i'm going to add these two numbers of 1 plus 2 to equal 3 2 plus 3 to equal 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, 5 plus 8 equals 13, 8 plus 13 equals 21, 13 plus 21 is 34, 21 plus 34 is 55, and 34 plus 55 gives me 89, etc. Now you might think to yourself, well that's just a typical pattern that anyone could make up, but the fascinating thing that what Fibonacci discovered was when you're actually working out the ratio or the proportion between two consecutive terms. Now you may be asking yourself what is so special about this sequence all it's simply doing is starting with two numbers making up a rule and continuing it until the cows come home. Now what Fibonacci discovered is although the sequence produced is never ending because it can go on forever is he discovered that when he worked out the proportion or the ratio between two consecutive terms that something fascinating was produced. So for example if I work out what the first term is divided by the previous term if I do 1 divided by 0, it should not let me do that because I can't divide by 0, but if I continue that format of doing 1 divided by 1, 2 divided by 1, 3 divided by 2, take it on the right cell, and then continued that, 
by working out the ratio and obviously you can see the numbers on the screen are all the numbers that are in the Fibonacci sequence but eventually it stabilizes to give me 1.61803389 as a common ratio now this number is incredibly famous and is more commonly known as the golden ratio now I'm not going to go into details what that what the common the golden ratio actually is but I strongly urge you that if you've got any interest in mathematics to do some research on Fibonacci and in particular focus on this golden ratio because it's absolutely fascinating on where this magical number can be found in the, both in the human body but also on earth in nature and in all types of things in terms of architecture art etc now also it kind of found that rounded this number up gives you 1.61 uh, which also then gives you numbers of 162 hence the name of this channel now, although Fibonacci sequence officially started with the numbers of 0 and 1, it is possible that you can use the method of Fibonacci with any sets of two starting numbers. So, for example, if I started with the numbers of, let's say, 2 and 6, then all I would then need to do is just simply, using Fibonacci, is just add the two numbers, previous two numbers, to work out what the next number is. So, the next number here would be 8, the next number here would be 14, the next number would be 8 plus 14, which is 22, next number would be 14 plus 22 which is 36 next number would be 58 the next number would be 94 etc so it is possible but again if i was to do 94 divided by 58 on my calculator and 94 divided by 58 it gives me an answer of 1.620689 and it carries on and lo, lo and behold if I continue this sequence eventually it would give me that golden ratio which is 1.618 or 6.22 decimal places it doesn't matter which two numbers you start with eventually as the sequence increases if you divide the you pick two consecutive terms divide the big number divided by the bottom number or the smaller number you would eventually end up to that golden Number. Now you can also apply Fibonacci to, into algebraic sequences. So here I've started with a and b. So the next term is going to be a plus b. And the next term is going to be where I add b plus a plus b, which is going to give me a plus 2b. Then I'm going to add these two terms together to give me a total of 2a plus 3b. Then I'm going to add the next two terms to that gives me a plus 2a which is 3a and then 2b plus 3b which is 5b then I'm just going to simply continue by adding those two terms together so I've got 2a plus 3a which is 5a 3b plus 8, 5b which is 8b and that can continue and also you can have some bit more complicated so here I've got a plus 2a which is 3a plus b because I've just got a single b then I need to add these two terms together which gives me 5a plus 2b. Then I'm going to add these two terms together, which gives me 8a plus 3b. Then I'm going to add these two terms together, let's use different number, uh, in which I get 5a plus 8a, which is 13a, and then 2b plus 3b, which is 5b. Again, I can then continue need to so you can actually apply Fibonacci sequence to anything as well as numbers but you can also get asked in algebra as well and just a reminder that there is a note sheet which covers everything covered in this video in the description below for you to download